you'll understand. But it is a joy to be together. Our text this morning is from Philippians chapter 3 and verses 7 to 11. If you turn there in your copy of God's Word, Philippians 3, 7 to 11. As we come to our text this morning in this book of Philippians, Paul, of course, focuses on two major themes in this book. One of them is that of joy and rejoicing, and those two words being used 17 times in this book. The other one is the idea of fellowship and the importance of fellowship, and we'll see that second idea prominently in our text. The second half of Philippians in chapters 3 and 4 focus us on the supremacy of Christ, and the fellowship therein of that supremacy is what Paul brings forward. Today, we look at one of the most impactful concepts that I've had in my life, that is, since the Lord has grabbed a hold of me. That primarily because in those 37 years prior to coming to know Christ, my life was an expression of what I ought not be doing. And this text describes that very well. The Lord told a parable of that very condition in Luke chapter 12. And I'd like to read it to you to begin our time together this morning. Luke 12, beginning in 13. Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the family inheritance with me. But he said to him, Man, who appointed me a judge or arbitrator over you? Then he said to them, Beware and be on your guard against every form of greed. Not for even when one has an abundance does his life consist of his possessions. And he told them a parable saying, The land of a rich man was very productive. And he began reasoning to himself saying, What shall I do since I have no place to store my crops? Then he said, This is what I will do. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have many goods laid up for many years to come. Take your ease, eat and drink and be merry. But God said to him, You fool, this very night your soul is required of you. And now who will own what you have prepared? So is the man who stores up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. This man pictures for us the wrong way that we are to address the things that we have as earthly possessions. I came to know the Lord and I realized this about myself. I understood that the things which I had been seeking in my life were wrongly focused. I'd been exclusively seeking material possessions a nicer house, newer cars, a boat, an RV. There was no lasting value in these. These were only earthly treasures. There is a concept in our text today that shows this very component. And of course, this is where we get to our idea of our title, How Do You Regard Christ? And in our text today, there are three perspectives of life so that you'll know the value of Christ. Let's take a look at our text and then we'll make some comments about it. Follow along as I read Philippians chapter 3, verses 7 to 11. But whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. More than that, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them but rubbish so that I may gain Christ and may be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ." the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith, that I may know Him and the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of His sufferings, being conformed to His death in order that I may attain to the resurrection from 
the dead. So this brings us to our first point in our discussion today, and I've titled that point, What Gain in Life? What Gain in Life? Let's first consider what Paul was referring to in the Scripture and then turn the laser light of God's Word upon ourselves. Paul begins by speaking of these things of gain. We must realize that these are good things that he is referencing. He is talking about the the good things in his life, positive aspects that bring advantage, things that the world would agree are of value. And he uses these familiar terms throughout our text of gain and loss, and it's important that we understand that these are accounting terms. It's if Paul is presenting before us a balance sheet with debits and credits or profit and loss. And in so doing, conveying spiritual truths in light of the context of accounting terminology. He takes these business terms to discuss this spiritual transaction and we all understand profit, don't we? As as a business person or an employee, you know that when you earn or sell your product that at a greater cost than it takes you to produce it, you have a profit, you have a gain. You know when you get a raise that this will make things a little easier at home as those managing a household. You know when groceries go up and someone is trying to get more from your limited budget. And you have to figure out how to make ends meet. And don't even get me started on the price of gasoline. (laughs) Even young people and young adults know this full well. The cost of entertainment goes up and you're going to have to do more work or more work around the house. And you're going to be doing and going less and buying less. So we all understand profit and loss. Paul is telling us in verse 7 that he abandoned the things of gain in his former life. And these are the things that he had just mentioned back up in verses 5 and 6. There he talks about being circumcised the eighth day. He was literally born into a religious setting. And in obedience, his parents brought him to be obedient to the law and circumcision. He was of the nation of Israel. He had been born into the religious world of Judaism and was a part of that world and coveted that role. He was of the tribe of Benjamin, so he was identified specifically with a group. He goes on and talks about he was also a Hebrew of Hebrews and a Pharisee. He pursued the faith which his parents had brought him up in with the greatest of zeal. And says so following that as to zeal, he was a persecutor of the church. And a righteousness which was in the law found blameless. Paul was pursuing all it meant to be a a religious individual with all of the vigor that he could muster. And these are the things that he now counts as loss. The things of earthly value or human achievement. Things that were of a good value from a Jewish perspective. And all counted as loss and account, on account of Christ. And because of this, Paul had abandoned all that was previously of value in his life. All that was gain, he now counted as loss. And he is not speaking of gain as something future. And this would be so much easier for us. Okay, Lord, all that stuff that I've done in the past that wasn't focused right, we'll just leave it there. Now from now on, I'm going to do better. No, Paul's not saying that. He's saying that everything that he had, all of these things that he had pursued, that they are loss. He had already attained them, all of these assets received, and yet they had no value. But it isn't the present attributes that are Now lost. He is taking these and he is jettisoning this baggage of perceived gain because he recognizes that it is spiritual loss. 
Loss is like throwing cargo overboard in a ship. And it's interesting that the only other time this word loss is used in the scripture is in Acts 27. When the boat's sinking and things are going bad and the sailors decide they're going to run it aground and they throw the cargo overboard. And that is loss. And so when he points out here that he, these things are lost, he says, they're not things I'm going to go back and find. I'm not going to go swim through the ocean and try and glean back some of these things. They are gone. They are of no value to him. And he casts off likewise all the former things for the sake of Christ. Understand that Paul did count the cost. He knew the effort that it had taken him to achieve these spiritual successes. Think back to what we know of Saul back in Acts chapter 8 when he was received the letters from the Sanhedrin to go throughout Israel as far even as Damascus and to take prison, take prisoner those who were contrary to the Jewish faith, those Christians, to bring them bound back to Jerusalem for beatings and imprisonment. He knew the effort that he had taken. He knew what this was all about. And he counted all of this as loss. This word counted as loss, it means to regard. It means to think. It means to consider deeply. To, to have a deliberate judgment. And there and there is great effort. It's not simply casual, oh yeah, I should have been doing differently. No, it, it is not that at all. It is, you know, pondering all of those things that are back there that were of no value with respect to Christ. And as he reflected on his earthly accomplishments, they were lost. You know, this is the one point of an entire book in the Bible, the book of Ecclesiastes. As Solomon wrote, he said that the pursuit of our lives under the sun is vanity. It is emptiness. It is nothingness. As we pursue earthly gain, it has no value for we'll pass it along to someone else who may squander it. And that is vanity. As we pursue fleshly indulgences and pleasures on this earth, they have no value. They have no lasting impact. They are vanity and emptiness. As we pursue relationships and social aspects and, and goals and achievements, they too are vanity and are nothing. And that's exactly what Paul is telling us, that these things done in our own strength have no eternal value. This must also be your perspective, beloved. You must consider what you are counting as gain in your lives then these must be compared with the value of Christ. Is it your home? You must count it as loss. Is it your marriage, your children, or parents? These two must be counted as loss. Jesus said, he who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. We are told to pick up our cross daily to pursue him. Every morning to recognize that we must put aside our worldly pursuits and focus on the pursuits of Christ and the cross as paramount. These are the things of lasting value. These are the things of eternal significance. Carrying forth the gospel of Jesus Christ and his cross to the dead and dying world that is all around us, that God has placed us in. Is it your job that provides for your family? This must be counted as loss. Jesus said, do not worry about what you, put, what you shall put on or what you will eat. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Is it your personal or social relationships? These must be considered loss. These are all good things in and of themselves. But they have no value alongside of the surpassing value of Christ and all of them must be considered as loss. Scripture says, what does it profit a man if he gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? We must understand that there is no value in any of that. And these are hard teachings. But beloved, this is the breakthrough in our faith. These are huge steps in our sanctification. 
You see, we must hold the things of this life loosely. But the things of Christ we must hold dear. One commentator said, The things of this earth rightly understood are blessings and of inestimable value if properly used as preparation for the reception of the gospel. But when viewed as the basis for self-satisfaction and glorification, as tickets to heaven, they become huge losses. This is our first perspective in life so that we know the value of Christ. That is to consider what gain in life. And our answer from verse 7 is nothing. Emptiness, vanity, there is no gain in this life. And that takes us to our second point, what loss for Christ? What loss for Christ in verse 8? That is, what will you give up for Christ? Look at verse 8 with me again. More than that, I count all things to be loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them but rubbish so that I may gain Christ. Paul begins here with this very emphatic statement. It's a transition out of verse 7 that makes a, a, a point that e this is even more significant than what he's just said. I love the King James and New King James introductions to verse 8. The New King James says, Yet indeed also, or the King James Version, and yea, doubtless, literally, but even more also. Paul is saying, if it weren't enough that I counted those things as loss, those things which I believed were gain, I state it now even more strongly. Yes, the things from verses 5 and 6, which were good things from a Jewish perspective, but more so now all things are lost to me. Anything and everything in life is that which is of no value. These are of no account, no consideration. But Paul has already identified the good things from a worldly perspective as lost. So what more was he speaking of here? Certainly this wasn't talking about negative or vain things, was it? No, not at all. Paul is talking about the things which were taken from him. Of course, his title, his wealth, his status, his social and religious standing. But more than that, the things that he pursued for Christ. Times of being imprisoned, being stoned nearly to death, derided by his own nation, counted as of no accord to the nation of Israel and all those around him, belittled and considered useless and a failure. Now, from a Christian point of view, as we think of those things, we might say, wow, Paul, that's pretty impressive. I mean, after all, I, I talk about as a pastor, well, if I were imprisoned, I'd be okay. But when they start closing the door and you hear the click, you might have a different idea. I might be a little weak there. But we would say, wow, Paul, you're the guy. You've done this. And he says, all of this, it's of no account. Even that is of no value to me. If you speak with any man who's been in full-time ministry, the chances are about 10 out of 10 that they've made some heavy sacrifices for ministry, endured some extreme ridicule, both to themselves and to their families, often endured significant financial, social, and personal hardship. Some would say, oh, how pious, how honorable to be in the ministry. And the perspective here is that all of that is loss. All of that is of no value. Although pursued for the right reasons and pursued for kingdom purposes, they are of no value. Paul is telling us here that he takes everything as of no account. And why is this? He tells us in verse 8, because of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. This is not a casual knowledge. 
This is not merely academic or head knowledge, like I've read the book, I know the stuff, and I'm good to go. This is personal, intimate knowledge. This is experiential knowledge. This is the knowledge that God speaks about having of his children in Amos chapter 3 and verse 2. It is the knowledge in the same word that Adam knew his wife in Genesis 4, 1, and he had relation with her. It is the equivalent meaning of the intimate shared experience of life with someone. This is how we must know Christ. Think about those relationships in your life that are most dear to you. Husbands, wives, children, parents, grandparents, those special people in our lives and how close they were and how dear the relationships were or are. We must exceed that in our relationship with Christ. And this is the knowledge of exceeding value, surpassing worth or excellence. This is an extreme superlative. This is taking it to the maximum level as if to, to reach out and touch the, the top of the possibility of great things in our life. And why does Paul place so much value on knowledge? Because this surpassing knowledge is that which produces salvation. It is the knowledge of the fact that we have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That we are undeserving of eternal life. It is the knowledge that our sin has separated us from God. And that separation being eternal damnation in hell for those that do not know and accept Christ as Savior. It is to understand that that is what we deserve for our sin. To understand that we must repent, that we must deeply regret the sins which we commit. But more than that, we must turn from those and to realize that this too is part of the knowledge which is a gift from God. And this experiential knowledge is that which allows us to fulfill Romans 10, 9. To confess with our mouths Jesus Christ as Lord and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead. And these present tense verbs mean that is the pattern of our life. I am constantly to be one confessing Jesus Christ as Lord. I am constantly one to be who is believing that God raised him from the dead and that this is to affect all of my life. The experiential knowledge is critical because this is the gospel. This is the understanding that through these things we have been saved. And that if you do not understand that today, if you do not recognize that you are a sinner and that that sin separates you from God, then you need to stop and consider that today must be the day where you would turn from that sin, where you would acknowledge that you have fallen short, acknowledge your self-righteousness and accept Christ as Savior. And of course, this knowledge is first and foremost of God as we see in the prophet Jeremiah. And in Jeremiah 9, 23, the prophet writes, Thus says the Lord, let not a wise man boast in his wisdom, and let not the mighty man boast of his might, and let not the rich man boast of his riches, but let him who boasts boast of this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord who exercises loving kindness, justice, and righteousness on the earth. For I delight in these things, declares the Lord. What is it that God has given us? Is it wisdom? Is it riches? Is it strength? These are not to be boasted of. Only Christ, only what he has done for us. We see more of this same expression in 2 Peter 1.3, where the apostle writes, seeing that his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. This is that process of salvation leading to sanctification. This is our growth. This is God giving us all that we need so that we can grow. We are not limited. 
We will never rise to the point where we have done all that we can to grow in godliness. And we must continually understand and pursue that knowledge and that truth. In addition to that, the threefold description of Jesus in verse 8 is not to be missed and so wonderful. Christ Jesus, my Lord. Christ describing the anointed one, the promised Messiah, the Savior who was to come throughout all the Old Testament. And Jesus, the, the man, Jesus from Nazareth, the first child of Mary. And the one who is Lord. That is, the one who is sovereign, the one who is ruler, the one who is master of our lives and to whom we must bow our knee as supreme authority. And we mustn't overlook Paul's statement where he says, my Lord, my Lord. You know, in the Old Testament, when we see some of the kings and they call in the prophets and they make statements to the prophet like, like pray to the Lord your God for me. You never want to be that person. You never want to be talking about his God or her God. It needs to be your God, beloved. It is Christ Jesus, my Lord. He has come to me. He has opened my eyes. He has given me a personal relationship with him. I didn't do it. I was following the world. I was following everything contrary to him. But he is now my Lord. Paul explains this more fully in Galatians 2.20. I have been crucified with Christ. And it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. This is who we are. This is all we are. This is the greatest gift. This is the greatest hope and joy. This is why we want to share this with the world. Because our world out there, it knows nothing of hope. It knows nothing of joy. It knows nothing of eternal peace. But God has shown us those things in the gospel of his son, Jesus Christ. Christ is much more than Paul's example and friend. He is his life. He is his love. He is his strength and his boast, his rock, his rewarder, his anointed savior and sovereign. And is he this to you? The question begs to be asked and answered. And each day we should ask it to ourselves. Is he your life? Are you ready this day to give up everything that you have, even life itself for Christ, that he may be exalted? That's what we're called to do. Is he your love? Is he more important in his relationship with you than your wife, your husband, your children, or anything on this earth? Is he the one that is your strength? That each day as you endeavor into what is put before you in the world, that you are trusting in him, that you are holding fast to him, that he is empowering you to carry forth. This must be who we are because all things must be loss alongside of Christ. And for these things, Paul suffered the loss of all things in verse 8. And more than that, he counted them as rubbish. The word used only here in the New Testament. It could also be translated as waste, as garbage, as dregs, as filth, as scraps. That which is worthless. The King James translates this word scubalon as dung. All of the good things, all of the things pursued in life are as nothing but refuse alongside of Christ. So I see our second perspective on life to understand the value of life. What loss for Christ? What will you give for Christ? For Paul, the answer was everything. Paul was never satisfied with his knowledge of Christ. He was always craving for more. And how about you, brothers and sisters? Are you craving more of Christ? Hungering and thirsting after righteousness? Are you ready to give up everything and to lay it on the altar? To sacrifice that which the rich young ruler would not when 
Christ questioned him regarding his faithfulness to the law. And he said, all of these things I have done since my youth. And he said, one thing you lack. Leave your riches behind you and follow me. And did he say, yes, Lord, okay, I'm in? No. He went away disheartened because he could not do it. May that never be us. May we recognize that we have nothing of value, no riches or anything, but that which is most great in Christ. Thus, what gain in life? Nothing. What loss for Christ? Everything. And in our third point, what gain with Christ? Look at verses 9 to 11 with me. And may be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ. The righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death in order that I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Paul sought to be found in him. What does that mean? To be found in him? What's he referring to? When will this happen? When will we be found in him? He's talking about when we will each meet him. When we will be brought face to face with Christ. Every person on this earth will stand before the Lord Jesus Christ. Those that do not know him to bow their knee and confess that he is Lord before they are eternally separated from him. For those of us that are believers to be welcomed into his presence and into his kingdom. Whether at his return at the rapture or whether we exhale our last breath on this earth to inhale at the next second in his glorious presence. Paul knew it was only by righteousness that he could approach. So with man, this is impossible as this righteousness comes from outside of us. As we hunger and thirst for righteousness, it can't come from us. I don't have it. I can't dig it up. I can't be good enough. So we must ask the critical question, how is it that we can be found? And Paul answers it in two ways. First, by means of what theologians call alien righteousness. Not having a righteousness of our own derived from the law. And keep in mind what Paul said in verse 6. He said, as according to the law, I am blameless. I'm without guilt. I'm without accusation. And yet this was not true righteousness. As Romans 3.20 states that no flesh is justified by the works of the law. So he is restating that his righteousness is useless. Paul is speaking first of the proud self-attained righteousness, that which comes through external morality, through religious ritual and ceremony, through good deeds, things produced by the flesh, things which cannot save. And beloved, you must guard against this this is something we so easily fall into. Oh, I go to church regularly. I give consistently. I try to serve when I can. If this is what we trust in, this is legalistic rule keeping. Church attendance, giving, serving, they're important, even necessary. But it is not where our righteousness comes from. Or some say, I'm a good person. Ever hear that? No, you're not. You're not a good person. At least not by God's standard. No one is good enough to get to heaven without Christ. That's why when they came to Jesus and they called him good teacher, he said, why do you call me good? There is no one good but one. And telling them what they've just said, rightly so, is that he is God. And no one else is. No one else is good enough. Rather, with Paul and so also, also with us, it must be righteousness through faith in Christ. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And it is a gift. 
It is a grace gift of God so that we would not boast to realize that he has given it to us. The righteousness of God on the basis of faith. He gives us that gift of faith so that we may believe and then we walk in that faith as our pastor has been teaching us so brilliantly because we have no righteousness of our own. In fact, Isaiah 64, 6 tells us that our righteous deeds are as filthy rags. And you don't even want to go and and look into what that terminology means, because it's not pretty. And that's all we can generate on our own. My best efforts, they're filthy rags. All of our righteous deeds are of no account. It's only Christ's imputed righteousness, His alien righteousness given to us that allows us to be found in Him, to be found in Christ. And the second answer is knowing Him in verse 10. It's the same intimate knowledge that we previously spoke of, only now it's specified into knowing the power of His resurrection knowing the fellowship of his suffering and conforming to his death. Knowing the fellowship of his suffering is being common partakers with Christ's suffering. Well, what does that mean? It means that as we go through suffering in this life, we do so as Jesus went through suffering. When we are reviled, we do not revile in return. We suffer recognizing God's sovereignty to allow everything into our life. And we endure them as Christ endured them. Hebrews 2.18 tells us how this can happen, where it says, For since he himself was tempted in that which he had suffered, he is able to come to to the aid of those who are tempted. As we are tempted, as we suffer, We can recognize that we have a great high priest in the heavens at the right hand of the throne of God who has suffered as we have. He knows what we're going through. He has an intimate knowledge of our struggles. Struggles with addictions. Struggles with relationships. Struggles with physical afflictions. Christ knew them all. And he tells us to suffer as he did, to recognize his pleading to his father in the garden. If it be thy will, let this cup pass from me, but not my will, but thine be done. Is this our prayer? Is this our attitude and struggles? J.B. Lightfoot says, The agony of Gethsemane, not less than the agony of Calvary, will be reproduced, however faintly, in the faithful servant of Christ. We all have suffered, and we will suffer yet more. And it is part of understanding what our Savior went through and what He has done. It is part of knowing intimately and experientially What Jesus did for you and for me, it's incredible to grasp. In knowing the power of his resurrection and conforming to his death is the other aspect of knowledge. This is the assurance of our immortality, as Romans 8, 5 states for us. For if we have become united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. Jesus Christ was raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who were going to God the Father. Do you know who the second fruits are and the rest following? They're all of us. We will, like he was raised, be raised as well. As our conforming to his death assures our resurrection, which also conforms to his resurrection. It was all a picture for us. It was all a a beautiful proclamation. It was all a part of recognizing that first, we must die to ourselves. This is what Romans 6 says. We must die and be buried to the things of this life in this earth so that we can be raised to the newness of life in Christ. 
Of what value is this to you, beloved? How important is it to know your final destiny? And not just to know it, but to be assured of it. Another commentator says that this is the pa- that this in this passage are the deepest secrets of the apostles' Christian experience unveiled for us. All of this should stimulate your moral and spiritual life. Beloved, of what value is Christ? We must turn the white-hot laser of Scripture's probing light upon our lives. We all have failings in which we seek the world's attentions and affections and acquisitions. And we must acknowledge and change this. These are the questions we must ask daily. How can I better know Christ? What true gain exists in your life? What will you give up for Christ? And because of this, what will be your gain with Christ? Go home and spend time in prayer, assessing the things in your life that are not being given over to Christ. And also pray about how your sharing in the sufferings of Christ by your quiet enduring and your gentle reaction when harshly wronged. And as you realize and correct wrong attitudes and actions, give the greatest exaltation and the most exuberant praise to God because He is doing this for us. He is doing this through us. And He is helping us do this one with another. You know, we all have these aspects of our lives that we focused on the good things that we thought were right and helpful in loving our wives or our husbands and loving our children and giving them the best. But may we understand that the best that we can give them and ourselves is the truth of Christ and following in His righteousness and growing in His holiness. Because this is His work and it results in your eternal presence with Him. These are difficult matters in which we can all grow. And as we do, may Christ be glorified as we regard Him of ever greater and greater importance and worth. Father, thank You for Your incredible love. Thank you for the gifts that you give us, Father. We are the most blessed people of all time to live at this time, in this place, in this country, in this beautiful state, and in this city. Father, to be together as your church here. And yet, Lord, may we never place anything on par or anywhere near what you have given us in Christ. May we be quick to lay all at your altar to pursue you with the greatest zeal and vigor which we can muster. May you help us understand all the ways that we fall short. Father, we know that there are many, many ways in which we sin. And yet, Lord, there are still more that you and your kindness have not chosen to reveal to us. Show us these things not so that we may be seen as righteous, not so that we may consider ourselves of any account, but so that the world may know you and that through us and our efforts, feeble as they may be, that the glory of the cross and our Savior Jesus Christ may go forth and that you might use us in whatever way possible. And for all this, we'll praise you because it is indeed all your work. We love you and we pray this all in the most holy name which we will ever speak, that name of the King of kings and Lord of lords, Christ Jesus, my Lord.